COVID-19 remains the story of 22. We'll talk with the state's chief medical officer about the crisis in our hospitals and about the fight that's broken out over a nursing home's report that hasn't even been released yet. And with a huge election year getting underway, we're still fighting over 2020 and the best ways to improve and secure American elections. Today is Sunday, January 16th, 2022, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. It is nice to be back in the studio this morning. Like so many other Americans, I was forced to work from home for a while after testing positive for the coronavirus. I'm happy to say it was a very mild case, and for that I'm grateful. But I was also disappointed because I feel like I was being pretty diligent. But then again, that diligence included the vaccines and the booster, which helped me avoid the problems faced by so many in the hospitals that are packed across the state. Week after week, I come to you on Sunday mornings talking about our health care workers being stretched beyond their limits. And somehow they keep finding new limits to stretch. I don't know how they're doing it. Ahead this morning, we're going to talk with the state's chief medical officer, Dr. Natasha Bagdasarian, about what she's seeing happen across the state. And we'll talk about the report that's due out tomorrow on COVID deaths in the state's nursing homes. Till now, we've understood that about 5,700 deaths occurred in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. But the report says that's an undercount by nearly 2,500 deaths. Is that accurate? Also this morning, the New Year outlook for Michigan businesses, surprisingly rosy, even as some high-profile closures have been announced in Detroit. We'll also talk about the fight over voting rights. 246 years after those most precious American rights were enshrined, here we are battling tooth and nail over how those votes should be cast. By creating rules around how the votes are cast, are we creating rules over who gets to cast them? It's all today on Flashpoint. When we came to you last Sunday morning, we had seen a short run of 20,000 COVID cases a day in Michigan, the highest level since the start of the pandemic. Happy to see those numbers come down a bit over the last week, but many of the state's hospitals remain on a crisis footing and Omicron is still running rampant. Let's talk about it with the state's chief medical officer, Dr. Natasha Bagdasarian. Doctor, really good to have you back on the program again. And let me, let's start, I, I wouldn't want to turn this into a roulette table and uh, because this is such a, a tough thing to predict, but do you say sense that uh, for Michigan, the worst of it's behind us? Are we in the middle of it right now or is it yet to come? Well, modeling shows that we're currently experiencing our Omicron surge. We know that just a few weeks ago, we were still seeing mostly Delta um, and Omicron has taken over in the state really fairly recently. When we look at modeling based on um, what academic researchers are putting together around the country, uh, based on Michigan's data, what they're really predicting is that we will peak by the end of January, maybe early February. So we have not seen the worst, uh, I fear. Yeah, so we're getting closer to that tipping point, though, which would be nice. But it's interesting. A lot of people seem to be building optimism around the idea that if we get past Omicron, uh, we, we kind of can, can, can move home free a little bit. I mean, how do we know Upsilon or whatever, you know, Omega isn't still behind it yet to come? What, what, what is our concern about the next variant? Well, I have to tell you, there will be new variants. There will be variants after Omicron. This is not the last variant of concern that we've seen. Now, what these variants will look like and how they'll behave, we don't yet know. Could they cause milder disease? It's possible. Could they cause more severe disease? We don't know. Um, it really depends on how the virus behaves. Mutations occur every time the virus has a chance to replicate. So the more the virus spreads, the more it makes mistakes and mutations and we don't know what those mutations will look like or how it will affect how the virus behaves. Yeah, uh, I want to talk to you about the testing problem. Uh, my own experience with it kind of gave me some insight into some of the shortcomings and problems here. I had tested had three uh, rapid tests that were negative. I had a PCR test that was negative and only the next day because I realized I had had another contact uh, with a family member who'd had it did I finally test that I have a rapid test that was positive. But the gap of waiting for that PCR our test was two days and somewhere in the middle of that was obviously when uh, my my status changed. 
uh, it seems to me that our tests are, are, are extremely limited by the time it takes to get the results back. And if you're having to wait days for the results, never mind getting enough tests around, isn't a, a big problem here, uh, the responsiveness of getting the results in. Well, first of all, I'll say that when you're testing, that test result only tells you your status on that day or right. at the moment that you take the test. So it doesn't tell you what could happen the next day. So if you've been exposed and you're incubating the virus, means that the virus is just taking hold and starting to slowly replicate, the test isn't gonna tell you that you're about to develop the disease. So having a rapid, or sorry, having a, a ready supply of tests is really vital so that people can test multiple times as you did. Um, so tests were negative on certain days telling you that the virus hadn't yet taken hold and then the test became positive. Um, and that's what we see. We're also seeing that antigen tests may be slightly less sensitive in the early course of disease, mm. which is troubling because we know that that's when a lot of transmission occurs. Yeah, uh, it, when it, with, in fact, when we were talking about testing earlier, I, I talked about this a little bit with the governor this past week. Um, we clear, we are now on the footing of trying to get tests into a, many more homes and, uh, and, and covering the costs of them as well, which is terribly important because these are all, these can be really expensive, 25 bucks for a pair of them. Um, but we weren't ready, were we, with, with, the, with the testing, uh, with a robust testing atmosphere that we needed when Omicron hit? Well, it really, um, when you look at the entire landscape of testing, we do have testing available. It just may not be the right type of testing for the right situations. So early on in the pandemic, the state really built up our ability to do PCR. So we had labs that were willing and able to perform PCR on fairly large scale um, platforms. And what we saw was that sometimes when things get really busy, that affects turnaround time. And so testing results aren't available right away. Um, when antigen tests were developed, we really, we Michigan was one of the early adopters of antigen testing, and we purchased a large number of those tests and rolled them out to schools very early on. And when over-the-counter tests became available, um, we also were early adopters and tried to buy those tests early on, but the availability simply hasn't been there. So when we talk about testing as a whole, there is testing available when we look statewide. There is PCR testing available, but does it meet our needs? It doesn't meet our needs in terms of turnaround time, having those test results available right away. It does help us in certain situations. So if someone's going to a hospital and we need to know um, whether they have COVID for treatment purposes, yeah. it may be slightly more helpful. But rapid antigen tests and over-the-counter tests in particular is what we really need. And we need enough of them so that Michigan's uh, residents can test multiple times, as, as you did. Yeah, exactly right, and that's to see people waiting in those long lines and then waiting for uh, for, for a couple of days for the results. Uh, clearly, we, we, we had to be disappointing to a lot of to you. Um, let, let's talk though about shots now in the vaccine. Uh, we had a poll, uh, the most recent WDIV Detroit news poll, kind of showed us that it's a pretty steady number of people who are insisting they're never going to get vaccinated. I talked to the governor about this a little bit last week. Do you see any way to make headroads uh, or inroads rather? I'm sorry, headway inroads. I combined the two uh, anyway that where we can kind of uh, chip away at that vaccine resistance that exists not only among people who are on the far right but clearly among a lot of Detroiters um, one of the things that continues to worry me are vaccination rates in certain communities um, and when we look at younger communities in general, or younger populations in general, they tend to be um, less willing to vaccinate. So our vaccination rates in 20 to 30 year olds, 30 to 40 year olds are not great. And then when we look at some specific communities and some specific racial and ethnic groups, the vaccination uptake is even lower. So one of the things that I'm very worried about is that the way that vaccine uptake is not equal across the board, we're leaving some communities very vulnerable to the effects of COVID. Um, and with this Omicron surge, they will be the most vulnerable communities. So I, uh, we are working on strategies 
to try to address that and some very specific communication tools um, and trusted messengers for the communities that have been left behind in terms of vaccination rates. I, I know that you were not uh, in your current position when all of these decisions were made, but we have this report that's due out tomorrow that even before it came out, a lot of people were debating and arguing over its findings, and that was about the nursing home deaths. It was a very controversial policy that was installed early on. It didn't, didn't seem to make sense to a lot of people to put COVID-positive uh, patients into a very uh, dangerous, it would seem, uh, and vulnerable population like nursing homes and long-term care facilities. But it seems that, at least according to what we're going to see in this report tomorrow, that the count of those deaths that occurred in those places was maybe off by about a thousand or so. Give me your reaction to what you've heard so far and what we need to do about it. Well, Devin, it's difficult for me to comment on things that occurred before I was um, both working at the state and actually before I was even in Michigan. Um, however, I can say that during the pandemic, what we've really seen is that tough decisions have to be made. Sometimes, um, you know, with, with very little notice as we learn new information and as the virus changes. And so this whole pandemic has just been an opportunity to learn um, and to be as agile and nimble as possible. And it's difficult, I think, to second guess some of those decisions that were made early on in the pandemic when, again, we were still learning about the virus and learning about how it behaved in certain settings. There will be a fair amount of that, no doubt, though, you know, of course, uh, when that report comes out tomorrow. Dr. Bagdasarian, I really appreciate your time. It's good to have you back on the program. Uh, stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me on today. You bet. When we come back, we'll talk about a number of other issues I need to get to, including voting rights in America. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. All right, we just had our update on the pandemic, but there are a number of other topics I want to get to, not the least of which is the fight over voting rights. Let's bring in this morning's roundtable with me this morning. Zoe Clark, Program Director for Michigan Public Radio. Uh, speaking of public radio, Stephen Henderson is here from Detroit Today on WDET. Chad Livengood is the Senior Editor of Crane's Detroit Business, and Nolan Fenley is the Editorial Page Editor of the Detroit News. And Nolan, let me start with you. My hunch is no matter what happens with this voting rights package, we're going to be fighting over things like early voting and absentee and tea balloting straight on through to Election Day again. But uh, give me your thoughts on where we stand right now. Uh, it doesn't look like President Biden's going to get his way here, does it? No. And I mean, if he's watching his approval ratings, he's going to have to pivot away from these issues that aren't on the top of America's priority list and towards things like the economy, inflation, COVID. And, you know, this, again, the, if you want to build confidence elections, if you want to restore trust in, in the vote, you don't do it by breaking the rules, busting the rules, and passing it on a straight party line vote. This is something Americans expect Republicans and Democrats to sit down together and discuss and come up with the solutions that might actually work to keep our elections secure. Zoe, it's really interesting. Both sides seem to need such different things to feel that their election day is secure. Well, and this is really kind of the American story when it comes to elections uh, over the past few years, right? That that after for so many uh, years now being told that elections are not fair or secure, that there uh, is folks within uh, the, the populace who go out to vote who really are concerned about that vote. And yet audits have been done, including in Arizona, that show that actually, uh, you know, and this is going back to 2020, of course, that, that, you know, overall, these were fair elections. But to Nolan's point, I mean, the president has a huge problem in two senators, uh, Sycamore and Manchin, uh, who are Democrats, who are not taking on to this uh, call. And he had uh, lunch with these Senate Democrats and basically came out uh, earlier last or late last week and said, yeah, it looks like this isn't going to happen. Now he's come out and said he's going to have another press conference uh, this coming week. Uh, close to the anniversary, of course, of his inauguration. We'll see if he decides to sort of double down on this issue. Yeah. But he does not have fellow Democrats on top of this. Uh, Chad, what are we hearing bubbling around in Lansing on this topic? You know, the election bills that the, that the Senate Republicans pursued, uh, that, that they sent over to the governor, she already vetoed them last year, kind of in that veto spree. She continued. And, you know, right now, there's been kind of a detente, uh, a ceasefire at this point. 
Uh, they have not moved any of those bills. I mean, you might recall back in December, they were all getting along, uh, the Republicans and the Democratic governor with working on economic development. Um, a lot of the focus just seems to be on how do we spend this $7 billion we got laying around in federal stimulus money and, and less about fighting election wars yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, let me get your thoughts. I, I keep coming back to this. We've got uh, two polit sets of politicians that seem to want different things. We've also got two sets of electorate uh, of constituents who see who want very different things to feel better about Election Day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, uh, uh, the, the idea that voting rights is the same as other kind of partisan legislation is the first uh, falsehood that we've heard about this, uh, and not the only one. Uh, this is about m ensuring access to the ballot. And let's take a note of the fact that we're coming up on the MLK Day holiday, and we'll hear all of these politicians talk about how much they love Martin Luther King, but they don't love what he stood for. They don't love what he fought the hardest for, which was uh, voter access, black voter access. Uh, that's what these bills are about, is about protecting uh, us against discrimination that still exists, flat out still exists, uh, very much as it as it has uh, throughout the country's history, uh, the idea that the filibuster, which also uh, is a tool that was used by Southern racists to prevent uh, equality for African Americans, uh, is now standing in the way of of uh, that progress. Uh, we we can do better than this. Uh, we just need uh, we need the other side, Republicans, uh, moderates. Uh, to understand how important this is uh, to making sure that democracy actually means something. Uh, Nolan, is that the problem among Republicans? They don't understand how important it is? Well, I don't know that uh, that uh, we who can make a case for voter suppression when voter turnout is going up in every election, even in the states that have been passed voter integ integrity bills. And it's, you know, the American people broadly support some of these measures, including showing voter ID and banning the sort of ballot harvesting you saw in Wisconsin in the 2020 election. Uh, again, this has got to be something that's done together or people, you're going to have half the population not trusted. And this is not uh, uh, something that you should ram through on a straight partisan vote. There are things we can agree on on election reform, I'm sure. But uh, as far as suppression goes, if that's the aim, it's doing a pretty poor job of it. Zoe, are there things we can agree on? Do you think both sides can, can find any common ground? I'm having a hard time finding it. Well, hey, I mean, let's not forget about 2018 when, when Michiganders uh, passed a ballot proposal that actually made it easier in some respects and more open to vote in terms of same-day registration. Um, yeah. And that was incredibly popular in this state. So, you know, I think this has always come back to this sort of uh, Republican versus Democrat uh, you know, Democrats want to make it easier to vote, and Republicans have always talked about access to the ballot and security of the ballot. And unfortunately, this issue has become more politicized than ever over the past few years. But absolutely, there is, when you look at the ballot proposal in 2018 that passed, you know, with more than 60 percent of the vote in, in Michigan, it yeah. was extremely popular yeah. and had bipartisan support. Yeah, it did. Uh, Chad, I want to move uh, to where we are uh, with the economy right now and what that portends for 20. 22. I'm kind of confused. Uh, retail sales over the holiday season were pretty darn robust, even though we just look at 7% inflation report just coming out this past yeah. week. And we had this report from the Detroit Economic Club. They're the uh, outlook among Michigan businesses right now for they're pretty optimistic. Uh, things look pretty robust uh, to them uh, for the year ahead, even though we're right in the middle of uh, this massive surge in the pandemic. What, what, what's your sense of where we are? Yeah, well, that's not exactly translating right now in uh, voter uh, attitude about the economy. This yeah. new poll that you all did with, with uh, the, the Detroit News, I mean, it found the, the, that uh, 63, almost 64 percent of voters think that, that the nation is on the wrong track. Yeah. And uh, and this is up steeply from just uh, a year ago where we were at 48 percent on the wrong track. And this think about just the a year ago, or excuse me, that was uh, that was in January 2020. So uh, obviously, a lot a lot has changed. And then you know, back to like May of 2016, this is the highest level since then, uh, at sort of the end of the uh, Obama years. Uh, and and so this is this is sort of an extraordinary uh, moment where you know, yes, according to all the data, people are spending. They're they're, they're 
they're, they're more employed. There's plenty of jobs, yeah. not enough people to fill them. Um, but people think that, that the country is still going to pot. Um, and yeah. the state's wrong track uh, numbers in that poll were 48 percent wrong track and 36 percent right. So uh, the state is still, you know, most voters still view the state in the wrong track. That obviously is not a good thing. If you are, if your name is Gretchen Whitmer uh, and you're facing re-election this fall, no matter who is the Republican nominee. Interesting, Stephen. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember which uh, political uh, commentator said this uh, recently, though. It used to be that it was the economy stupid. Well, now, depends on which version of the economy you choose to see, I guess. Uh, so I'm not sure we all can, obviously can seem to agree on exactly where we are uh, in the business and economic world right now. What do you see, Stephen? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, things are going very well in a number of different ways. And they're going well at the top, where you see the S&P 500 hit 68 highs in the last uh, 12 months. Um, uh, and on the other end of the scale, where wage growth has, has come back in an important way, unemployment um, is, is down. I think that the general discontentment that people feel is what, is is being reflected in these polls. Sure. People are very scared still about the pandemic. People yeah. are very worried about the future. And I think then when you ask them, how are things going? Are things going in the right direction? Uh, the answer they're giving you is about all those other concerns mm -hmm. more so than, uh, than, than the pocketbook issues. Uh, that, that, as we see, are not nearly as acute as, the, as they have been even in recent years. Nolan, what are you seeing? Well, what, I, I, I can't imagine what you're talking about. P, this is not perception. That's what I mean. Which economy store. are you seeing? Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, this, well, it's not perception. You go to the grocery store and your milk, eggs, poultry, 11% uh, higher. Your new vehicles or used vehicles, 30% higher. Gasoline, 50% higher. Heating bills, 30% higher. This is real pocketbook stuff. This is not people um, out there saying, well, something might be wrong, but I can't figure out what it is. They know what it is. Worst inflation in 40 years. And this administration did not take it seriously. When it first emerged, they said, ah, it's transitory. We're going to go out and focus on all these other things on our priority list. Inflation is about the worst thing that can happen to the economy because it's going to have to be managed, it, managed. and managing it risks throwing the country into recession. It's a very delicate thing. And so, I mean, this yeah. is not two versions of an economy. Everybody's paying more, and it's cutting into everybody's paycheck, everybody's household household budgets. Zoe, you get the last 30 seconds. Your thoughts quickly. I think we're in a malaise, and I think that the economy right now is very difficult. But to Stephen's point, there's not a lot to look forward to right now. And we are a people <laughs> that like to look forward to trips and going out to dinner and seeing friends. We are in these cocoons yet again two years in, and we have been living through a global you know, pandemic, and that is hard. And yeah. so I think it's a combination. It is a lot of gunky stuff in a big old nasty yeah. soup right now is what it is. And Flashpoint has to do a little business as well, which means I got to get to a break. Gang, thank you all so much for being here. Happy New Year. We'll talk to you all again soon. Back with more in just a minute on Flashpoint.